Ha, an Newton herhalde. She is muted. Yep. Got there. Hello. 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 Hi. I am here. Good to meet you. Yeah, likewise. Likewise. Yeah. Good to meet you too. Yeah. Um maybe we should wait for a few minutes uh, more. Yeah, are you okay uh, doing I... that? Huh? Yeah, that's fine with me. Okay. And as I understand from Oktay, who is the host, uh, we are going to uh, actually even the recorded start recording started, and uh, we are going to uh, put this on YouTube later. Okay. Uh, there are some technical issues, uh, I believe, uh, some bureaucracy, as I understand, because <laughs> <laughs> always, uh, always, yeah. Anyway. Uh, so uh, people will be able to listen to your presentation uh, also on the YouTube. Um, should we start? Uh, let me say the following. Uh, the uh, plan is uh, about an hour, uh, Francis will talk. And after her talk, we'll take questions for about 20 minutes or so. Um, mm -hmm. And a very short uh, introduction, actually. She doesn't need any introduction because she's quite well known, but uh, <laughs> she is, uh, according to I her. Managed, see whether I managed to make this last an hour, but if not, then we can just have lots more questions. Yeah. Um, she's an author, uh, speaker, uh, and singer. Uh, she's <laughs> an expert in banking, uh, money, and uh, cryptos. And she's going to talk about uh, cryptos tonight uh, with the title, How to Land Your Helicopter. Francis. Yes, I'm just working out how to share my screen. Because um, what I want to do is to share that. Share. But I actually need to actually do it as a slideshow, which I'll... Work out how to do in a minute. Slideshow, that's what I need. Slideshow, come on. Hey, there <laughs> we go. Wonderful. That wasn't too bad, was it? Can you all see? Yes. And can you all hear? That's the other thing. Yes. Perfect. And let me just check. I'm going to put plug my computer in just so that it doesn't suddenly die on me in the middle of the talk, which has been known to do before. OK, I think we're all set to go. Right. I've uh, entitled my talk, How to Land Your Helicopter, um, The Future of Monetary Policy. Um, it, it, this is kind of a reference to, I guess, Milton Friedman and his famous helicopters, um, which it was all about the idea that you could reflate an economy by dropping money into it. Now, you might say we've moved on beyond that now, that we dropped loads and loads and loads of money into the economy over the last two to three years. And now our problem is removing it again, which is why I've titled my talk how to land your helicopter, because it seems to me that um, central banks have been, and indeed governments have been very good at flying helicopters everywhere and dropping loads of money. But they're now trying to figure out how to land the helicopters without crashing them. So I thought I would start um, with kind of the first rule of landing a helicopter. Now, I confess I have never flown a helicopter, helicopter in my life. But uh, I'm sure that one of the things you need to know if you have to want to land helicopters, you need to know where you are, you know, because you've got to be able to see your landing site and landmarks around it and, you know, be able to guide your way in. So I'm starting tonight with a survey of how we got here, what the main landmarks are and what the weather is, by which I mean the economic outlook. 
in economic terms. Um, that's our weather, isn't it? So, okay. I thought I'd start by talking about the effect of QE. Monetary base in most central banks is much larger than before the financial crisis, the 2008 financial crisis. And it's also, and perhaps this is more important, much larger than the quantity of reserves needed by banks to settle payments. The primary purpose of reserves in banks is to enable them to satisfy deposit withdrawal requests. Now, those might be requests for somebody simply to remove their funds or to transfer their funds to another account or at another bank or to make a payment to someone else. All of those are deposit withdrawals. Obviously, the one that says I want to remove my funds in the form of physical cash means banks have to hold physical cash and they do. Um, it's what they put in their ATMs and they also hold physical cash notes and coins in their vaults. But um, most of the uh, what we call the reserves that um, central banks hold are not physical notes and coins, they are electronic money. Um, and that's be really because in much of the world now, most of the payments we make are electronic. Um, we have, there are countries in which cash is still king, by which I mean physical cash. Um, but governments have done huge amounts, really, to move people away from this dependence on physical cash, not at least because physical cash is really quite insecure for ordinary people, particularly for the poor, um, because it's... Um, open to thieves, it can, if it's paper money, it can burn, it can be eaten by mice, all sorts of things can happen to it. So there's been quite a drive by governments and pushed also by the World Bank and the IMF to move countries, to move people in poorer countries away from relying on physical cash and towards using forms of electronic money, lots of which are um, the gateways for a lot of which are banks. Um, although in some countries, the gateways are not banks, they might be mobile phone companies. It depends where you are. But we're talking here about banks. Banks historically use reserves to make payments. They've now got far more reserves than they need to make payments. We don't make this sort of volume of payments. Um, the rapid build up and the increase in excess in reserves, what we call excess reserves, is a direct consequence of QE. So over a decade of QE, um, particularly the enormous QE of the pandemic era, um, has resulted in this huge big build-up. You can see the OECD from the OECD chart there, just how big the increase during the pandemic was. Um, and unwinding that is not going to be easy. The big build-up of reserves forced a policy change by central banks, which actually goes back quite a long time now, but it's still in force now. And that is to do with the fact that when banks have collectively have more reserves than they know what to do with, and they can't easily unload them, um, the um, market interest rate for reserves drops to zero. Nobody wants reserves. So um, central banks set a floor under the price of reserves to really to stop it dropping Below, to zero or below um, by remunerating um, deposit, reserve deposits at the central bank. Um, it's what we know as a floor system. And so banks now are paid to keep deposits at the central bank and those deposit, that the, the interest rate on those deposits is an important part of monetary policy. Central banks still talk as if the main policy rate is the marginal lending rate for bank, at which they lend reserves to banks. Um, but in fact, that marginal lending rate, and when you've got excess reserves, is really not that important unless you're also remunerating reserves. It's the, it's the, the deposit rate that really determines monetary policy. And that raises questions about the um, conduct of monetary policy 
in a rising interest when interest rates start to rise as they are doing we and the relationship with governments and with government borrowing costs we've seen a fair degree of pushback already in my country about the fact that the interest rate on reserves is effectively the a floating interest rate on government debt because QE predominantly the um, assets backing QE um, liabilities are government debt. Um, it, that in effect you have exchanged fixed rates government debt for floating and government and government is now fully exposed to um, Bank of England interest to central bank interest rate policy. And there are people who want the um, interest rate on reserves dropped down to zero, um, effectively a tax on banks, um, so that the government should not have to pay the increase in interest rate, interest costs arising from Bank of England monetary policy. I'll come back to this later because I actually think this is quite dangerous, but I think we should be aware that there are these kind of debates around that something that has looked like a bit of a boon that um, it, it, setting this floor under the um, price of reserves um, actually, among other things, helped to stop the cost of the price paid on savings from dropping below zero as well, um, has, is going to turn out to be somewhat inconvenient and expensive from the point of view of governments. And that's going to raise questions, I think, about the independence of central banks and conduct of monetary policy going forward. One other thing has come out of this massive increase in the size of the monetary base. And that is that we now know, actually, that the size of the monetary base itself doesn't have a great deal of imp impact on inflation. It does affect bank lending because banks are collectively obliged to hold the entire monetary base, except for physical currency. And as I've mentioned, they hold quite a lot of that, too. Um, since bank reserves are counted in leverage ratios, um, deadwood effects on bank balance sheets can reduce bank lending. And so a very large monetary base is therefore, all other things being equal, slightly deflationary. I bet people would never thought of that. Now, moving on, I'm just going to now talk about the other side of bank balance sheets. And this is the asset base. This is also much larger than before the 2008 crisis. Central banks now hold large quantities of their own government's debt, uh, which in principle gives them effective control of yields. Though, as far as I know, at present only the Bank of Japan is explicitly doing yield curve control. A lot of other banks have, have toyed with it though. I mean, the ECB arguably does yield curve control because it needs to control the spreads over bonds um, to, to stop the Euro crisis, Eurozone crisis reappearing again. So I think the ECB does do a certain amount of yield, control, yield curve control to preserve the integrity of the Euro. And um, you know, there have been suggestions that the Bank of England also recently tinkered with yield curve control when it was controlling the long end of gilts to make it possible for pension funds to raise cash to meet their margin calls. So yield curve control is something that, that central banks can do. It creeps in from time to time. Not many do it explicitly, but it is an implicit thing that they do and it's part of the tool set. Central banks also hold a range of other assets of varying credit quality, including foreign government debt, corporate bonds and equities. Unwinding these enormous portfolios runs the risk of destabilizing markets. And if it's done when yields are rising, it also raises the prospect of significant real, realized losses for central banks. A few years ago, we used to have a debate about what would happen if a central bank became insolvent. When we're in a period of quantitative tightening at a time when asset prices are falling, which they're bound to do, that question will reappear again. And again, that will raise questions for governments as to what their responsibility towards central banks is. Moving on now to the effect of QE. The main effect of QE is to raise the prices of assets of all kinds, um, 
government debt, obviously, because it's act that actively buying government debt and any other assets actively buying a big player like that in the markets, buying potentially unlimited quality quantities of the things, um, is going to raise the prices. And indeed, that is the point, because the yield is inverse of price. So when you raise the price of your asset of your uh, government bond, um, you depress the yield. And so you put, put downwards pressure on interest rates. And that was the point. There are spillover effects to assets of all kinds, obviously, because your government bonds benchmark everything else. Everything else is, is priced pretty much on the spread over, over um, governments. Um, and so if your government if your government yield has dropped, then the, the yields and everything else are likely to drop as well. Um, it also has spillover effects into things like commodity markets, fine, fine wines, art, real estate, um, because one of the effects of taking safer assets out of the market is you drive investors into riskier as into different asset classes. And one of the things we've seen is investors not only moving into riskier assets, but just diversity, diversifying generally. So that has tended to drive up the prices of all assets. So as central banks in bank on, embark on quantitative tightening and interest rates rise, we should expect asset prices to fall. And that price will be, I'll use the term permanent. I mean, perhaps the term indefinite would be better because we can't rule out that, that we won't pivot in the other direction at some point and push them all back up again. Um, you know, the history of, of, fi of finance shows that actually we go through periods of asset price rises and then periods of asset price falls. Um, those periods can be very long. Um, I, one of the things that struck me when I read Thomas Piketty's first book, Capital, was that the first half of the 20th century was pretty much a sustained period of capital destruction. It went on for 50, for over 50 years. Um, we can't assume that just because asset prices have been rising for a very long time, that, that means they can't fall. And equally can't assume that just because they're falling, it's going to be short-lived and they'll rebound quickly. It might not be. It really depends on other factors, on other circumstances. And I wouldn't like to put a time frame on how long, for how long asset prices are going to fall. But it does seem to me that we do have quite a bit of excess capital kicking around the place or capital that shall we say is not properly deployed. And so I would expect um, there to be asset price falls probably over a sustained period of time. For some assets, and I would have to say, I, I would highlight cryptocurrency at this point, um, Falling asset prices, rising interest rates, and the unwinding of quantitative easing is an existential threat. Crypto has never known anything other than an easy money paradigm. It was born at the time that QE started, and it and if you actually look at the prices of cryptocurrency, it tends to follow the path of QE. So if QE disappears entirely, I wouldn't like to kind of hold a torch for the future of cryptocurrency. That doesn't mean I think that things like Bitcoin will necessarily disappear entirely, but I think the kind of inflated values for crypto that we've seen over uh, appearing over the last five, six, seven years are not going, not going to remain or, or come back. I mean, crypto has already fallen a lot it's fallen a lot it's fallen some more in the last couple of days and i don't think we've seen all the leverage all the leverage has been squeezed out of that system by any means yet so i think there's a lot more to come now i am famously crypto skeptic and bearish so maybe this is just me being being my perma bear self but it just seems to me that this is a completely different paradigm for crypto and it may be that a lot of the crypto ecosystem as we now know it is going to disappear and never be seen again, something else will take its place. Now to one, one of the unfortunate effects of um, quantitative easing, and indeed actually not just the quantitative easing, but of both monetary and fiscal policy really since the 2008 recession, 
And that is a substantial widening in inequality. Um, QE works by raising the prices of assets predominantly held by the rich and the old. And it's therefore had the unfortunate effect of increasing wealth inequality. And this has been exacerbated in some countries by fiscal consolidation involving spending cuts and tax rises that disproportionately hit the young and the poor. Um, and so this has been an effect of fiscal transfer from the young and poor to the old and rich. And that's what we're seeing in, in, in income inequality. So the combination of loose monetary policy with fiscal consolidation is significantly deflationary, is in my view the reason why until really the end of last year and beginning of and this year, we did not see inflation during the whole of the post-crisis period. Um, that that combination was a huge drag on growth and on inflation. And related to that, what I, I, I borrowed this from Positive Money because I think it's rather good. And, and, uh, and I am actually slightly relieved to see that in a way this marvelous experiment we've had with monetarism, with using money, um, creating money to stimulate demand and so forth, it actually hasn't worked too well. That we put immense amounts of money into economies and not much of it has trickled down to the economy. So we've actually had quite stagnant growth in many places at the same time as, as um, central banks have been putting enormous amounts of money into the economy. Um, and I lay a lot of the responsibility for that at the door of governments who have used um, QE as cover for the fiscal consolidation that I mentioned before, when QE actually doesn't offset it, really. That said, we don't actually know the counterfactual here. We don't know the extent to which QE has improved economic prospects. I've seen some research that suggests it has, to some extent, increased economic growth, reduced unemployment, and improved the prospects of the poor relative to the counterfactual. But the drag caused by the fiscal consolidation does make it difficult to establish how effective that is. I think it's probably fair to say that if we hadn't had QE offsetting fiscal consolidation, the prospects of the economy, the um, outturn for the economy might have been much worse. And perhaps our best example of that is actually Greece, which embarked on an extremely harsh fiscal consolidation without any monetary support. Um, Greece was excluded from ECB QE um, and still is. Um, it was included in the pandemic. Um, bond purchase program, fortunately, and there have been quite, there's been quite a bit of debate in ECB circles about how it should go about withdrawing that when the effect on the Greek economy is likely to be quite severe. So it would seem that QE does, does protect economies to some extent from the effects of fiscal consolidation. The question is whether that's an appropriate use of QE. Um, you know, should governments really be doing harsh fiscal consolidation in the aftermath of a very deep recession. And you know, from where I sit, no, I would have preferred to have seen looser fiscal policy and less QE. I think we would, I think that would have been a better mix after the financial crisis and would have left us in better shape to handle the extraordinary um, shutdown of the pandemic and the pressure on essential public services such as healthcare. So, but what this um, does raise is the question of how central banks will manage, uh, how governments, fiscal authorities will manage their debt and their deficits when central banks are no longer offsetting them, uh, offsetting any attempt they do to bring down their debt and deficits. We seem to be going into a period where central banks and are going to do quantitative tightening and raise interest rates at the same time as governments are going into fiscal tightening, in some cases quite harsh fiscal tightening. My own government is talking about trying to close a, a, a fiscal black hole of 50 billion and putting together packages of spending cuts and tax rises intended to close this hole. 
at the same time, um, when they did this before, it's a similar scale to the fiscal consolidation that they embarked on in 2011. But then we had the Bank of England doing QE or uh, uh, or maintaining its QE purchases, even if it wasn't actually doing QE. Now, the Bank of England is going to be actively selling down gilts. It's going to be actively raising interest rates. It has indicated already it's going to raise them more at the same time as the government is going to try and reduce its debt and deficit. This doesn't strike me as um, holding out um, a great prospect for the UK economy or for the well-being of its population. And I think these are the kind of things that we have to think about. It looks ominously like a like a helicopter heading for a crash landing. I want to talk a little bit about bank lending as well. I've mentioned already that excess reserves can act as a deadwood effect on bank lending and therefore can be slightly deflationary. Um, there is little evidence that the QE done after the great financial crisis stimulated the private sector creation of M2 in line with the monetary base. I mean, here we have the, this is the United States, obviously. We have M2, is a little blue line creeping along the bottom, and the monetary base is the one that's shooting up all over the place. And I think you can see that it's really very little change in M2 for all that um, that monetary base increase, we've got all these big spikes in, in the monetary base. And M2 is pretty much plodding along, not varying much. I must add that this is growth, by the way, not amounts. Um, this is the change. Um, so the money multiplier, if it ever existed at all, is quite definitely broken in the era of excess reserves. Again, we don't know the counterfactual. It might be the bank lending would M2 creation would have been a whole lot worse without the monetary base, the excess monetary base creation. We just don't know. But I think we can clearly see that the idea that the banks take excess reserves and will multiply them up to, into lending into the real economy just doesn't happen. That's not how they work. And I, I've been banging on about this for years. That's not what banks do. Banks will lend when the risk versus return profile is in their favour. And for a lot of the last 14 years, it hasn't been. Um, if you want to um, encourage bank lending, you need to kind of improve the prospects for your economy, really. Um, however, it does appear that the fiscal stimulus of the pandemic years was effectively monetized by large scale QE. You can, I think, see that at the end of this slide. It's difficult for me to see it from here, but um, because my, the thumbnail is covering it, but you should be able to see at the end of this that the um, there's quite a spike in M2 as a result of monetary base creation in the pandemic years. And this is also apparent on the next slide. You see, this is the ECB. Here we are with M1 and M3, okay. M1, because of the way we do QE, M1 does increase um, as a consequence of QE because when, when the central bank buys bonds from the private sector, if it buys bonds from non-banks, then the commercial bank that intermediates the payment will accept the reserves in payment from the central bank, but will then create a new deposit in the non-bank's deposit account. And that new deposit um, counts towards M1. So when, um, when you do QE in a way that buys bonds from investors rather than just from banks, M1 increases as well as M0. But M2 and M3, the, um, the broader money, doesn't necessarily. And so if you look at the monetary aggregates here for, um, for the ECB, for the Eurozone, um, during this period, you can see that um, M3, as with the Fed chart, M3 um, growth was generally below that of M1 until we got to the pandemic when it tracked it. Um, and if you look at the right hand chart, you should see that the big 
change in in um, credit during this time was into was to general government. So um, again, we're seeing that in effect the ECB was monetizing government debt. Now I know that's illegal in the eurozone. It was doing it indirectly. It was doing it via the secondary market, but in effect it was doing enough. Um, is QE the right term? It was a special program for the ECB. They didn't call it QE. They called it PEP or something. Um, effectively mopped up government bond issue, issuance. And we saw the same thing with the Fed. We saw the same with the thing with the Bank of England. Of course, the Bank of Japan has been doing that forever. And if we look at the next slide, we'll see the same thing happened in the UK. Right, and um, in 2020, the year of the pandemic, the Bank of England's asset purchases completely offset the central government's borrowing needs. Could we call this deficit, deficit monetization? I personally would, even though it's indirect. Um, it may, it effectively removed the external borrowing constraint for the government. And so we've seen this happening across the develop, developed worlds that central banks were removing the external borrowing constraint from their governments to enable them to, um, to fund the enormous expenditures needed to keep people and businesses alive while shutting down half the economy. Um, and I confess, I was one of the people who said this was a good idea. This is exactly what central banks should be doing. It, the fiscal authority's job was to keep people alive while they were unable to work, unable to produce, while supply chains were broken because travel had stopped. Yeah, every, all uh, the immense disruption of the pandemic lockdowns. Um, and central banks should support their governments to enable them to do that. It's a good use of what I call QE for the people. It's, in my view, only to be used in exceptional circumstances. And there is a price to be paid for it. And that price can be inflation when you come out of your period of shutdown because your demand side is going to recover faster than your supply side. And your supply side, your supply chains are going to stay broken for quite some time. And indeed, that is what we've seen. So during the pandemic, central banks monetized their own government's deficits, in effect, removing the normal market constraints on fiscal borrowing and expenditure, keep enabling them to stay alive. Some governments also did helicopter money, which is one of fiscal drops effectively financed by their central banks. So the US's stimmy checks and the UK's SACE scheme. I'm reluctant to say the furlough scheme. A lot of people recall that, that helicopter money, but that's more like a wage wage subsidy really but the say scheme had given to self-employed people which was five one-off drops which were not ad which people weren't anticipated people didn't know about them in advance um, those meet the definition of helicopter money so let's look at this question of inflation then okay pandemic stimulus has generated some inflation as i said in my book on people's qe it's supposed to Helicopter money and um, deficit monetization, if that's what you're doing, should generate some inflation. Because you think about when you're going to use it, you're going to use it when your economy is on the floor and you're potentially going into a deflationary spiral. So you want to increase growth and lift inflation. You want there to be some activity. We can question about whether in a pandemic, when the whole economy is being deliberately shut down, raising de uh, demand as much as governments and central banks did, was all that sensible. I personally think that the US at least overdid it. And that's why they've now, they, they have more inflation than they than they can manage and the, and the Fed is having to row back on it quite hard. But that's not necessarily a bad thing. I, I, I think that it's better to overshoot on your support of the, of the economy um, and end up with some inflation than it is to under support and end up with starvation. But the inflation we're now seeing, and I've put this chart up just to show you 
what kind of inflation we're seeing. And you should see, I think, that um, really the, what is causing the inflation that we have now is, um, is really food and energy. And that is caused by supply chain disruption and latterly by an unforeseen war. Um, I, wars are inflationary, they, they destroy supply chains, they destroy productive capacity. Um, and in the case of this particular war, we're talking about a war between a major oil producer, oil and gas producer, and, and a major food producer. It is obvious that there's going to be disruption to the supply of those commodities, and that is going to feed through into inflation. And tragically, it's particularly, I think, I mean, these are development, you know, OECD, OECD countries here, but it's particularly going to hurt developing countries where the dependence upon imported foodstuffs can be much more and they can be much more sensitive to swings in world food prices because everything's priced in dollars. Um, it, it's really not a very happy situation. I would like to see the world doing more to relieve the pressure on developing countries from, from the Ukraine war. So there's now consensus among central banks that their job is to remove the punch bowl. The problem is that they, so they think of this as raising interest rates and reversing QE, but really it might be more appropriate to call it trying to land their helicopters. And the problem is they've never done this before. They've never done the kind of extraordinary combined fiscal and monetary stimulus that we had during the pandemic. And also, and that followed on from you know, 10 years of continual QE and low interest and historically low interest rates. So it's fair to say central banks actually don't know what they're doing. And they've got to learn how to land a helicopter safely in very difficult weather conditions when they can't really see. Um, and they've never done it before. Um, I think the chances of crashing are quite high. And indeed, they're already making mistakes. We've seen a few in the last couple of weeks. I've listed some here, how not to land your QE helicopter, dump large quantities of assets onto the markets while simultaneously raising interest rates, because what's that going to do to your market? Another one is trying to return to the pre-2008 monetary system. Now, I've mentioned this already right at the beginning when I talked about the floor system. And we have immense quantities of excess reserves in the system. And the financial market uh, system has adapted itself to that. And um, that's partly been driven by regulation as well. So if they now try to go back to the pre-2008 system where banks, generally speaking, didn't hold more than a fraction of the reserves needed to settle payments and they would uh, um, borrow them on a just-in-time basis um, or, in, uh, or on a prepositioned basis, so projecting their um, operational liquidity needs forward 30 days and prepositioning collateral so they could obtain the reserves they need. That's kind of how the pre-2008 the pre monetary system worked. Um, to go back to that now, I think would A, mean draining an immense quantity of reserves from the system ever so fast, either that or introducing really very high reserve requirements, in, a, in effect locking up reserves in the, in the central banks so they can't be used, um, which doesn't strike me as a very sensible way of, of running a financial system that has been become dependent upon there being copious liquidity, um, largely consisting of um, bank reserves and cash and um, collateralized by government debt. Um, so it seems to me we're going to be stuck with a floor system for quite a long time to come. And so I think that central banks should be making more efforts to understand the relationship between the interest rate on reserves and the interest rate on lending, marginal lending rate, um, and to have plans in place for how they are going to manage um, the spread between the two in order to optimise monetary policy in a much higher interest rate environment. And related to that is this tax banks for holding reserves thing, which I think is lunatic, but it is, a, an, it is an indicator of the kind of fiscal pressures we're already seeing on central banks, that as interest, rate rise, interest rates rise, then 
and then um, it, the central banks will be paying much more to banks for the privilege of holding their reserve deposits, which, as I've pointed out in the era of QE, are backed by government bonds. So are effectively um, converting government the interest rate on government bonds to floating rates um, uh, uh, set by the central bank. And that's going to go up. And so there are considerable moves afoot to say, oh, no, you shouldn't do that. What you should do is drop your deposit rate to zero so that banks aren't remunerated for the reserves and just rely on the lending rate. And I don't see how that's going to work while you've still got huge quantities of excess reserves in the systems. I, the system, I think people who are proposing that have not understood how this system works, because the moment you start interfering with the, um, with the deposit rate, you're interfering with the market for reserves and, and also with things that depend a benchmark off that. Um, so for example, the savings rates on deposits, the interest rates on deposits, ordinary retail deposits, will remain much lower than they really should. And that, in a way, is a handout to banks um, saying, OK, you can keep rates on savings accounts at nearly zero because there's no floor. There's no you you, you haven't got a, a three or four percent um, interest rate deposit available to you at, at the central bank anymore so you can just it's if you deposit your reserve your your money at the central bank they, they'll pay you zero so you only need to pay just above zero to your savers um while charging six seven eight percent on loans it doesn't strike me as a particularly i, I know i call it taxing banks for holding reserves it's actually an opportunity for banks to make lots of money on the spread between savings deposits and loans, which is, I'm not sure, something we should be encouraging, really. Um, so I think people need to think this through a bit more about the implications of some of the proposals that they make, interfering with the transmission of, of monetary policy in what is going to be a flaw system really for quite a long time to come, I think, because I don't think we're going to be able to reduce the quantity of excess reserves in the system that quickly. Um, fight with the fiscal authority, and this is kind of the same thing, really, that, that if you've got a fiscal, fiscal authority that's saying, hey, I don't want to pay these interest rates, and you're a central bank, what are you going to do? Um, are you going to do some yield curve control? Um, are you going to um, drop your um, interest rates on reserves a bit so that it's not quite so expensive? And particularly, if you've got a fiscal authority that wants to do some quite that is issuing a lot of debt, um, maybe it's supporting energy prices or something like that. I mean, this is a very expensive period for households and a lot of governments do want to um, ease the, the, the pressure. Um, then issuing a whole load of gilts uh, of, of, your, of government bonds onto the market yourself at the same time as your government is issuing new government bonds doesn't strike me as stunningly clever. Um, it's not sensible from a market operation point of view, and it's also not sensible from the point of, from a government borrowing cost point of view, because you're going to raise the cost of government borrowing by doing that. So, and that's setting up a fight with your fiscal authority. <laughs> so those are some, some things, areas where I think better coordination between banks and fiscal authorities is still going to be needed, even in a quantitative tightening paradigm. Um, and also refuse to provide liquidity to distressed markets. We've seen this before. Um, when the Fed tinkered with um, quantitative tightening before, back in 2017, 2018, um, it overdid it. And it ended up causing a repo freeze. Um, in 2019, which was caused by it thought it could remove more reserves from the system than turned out to be the case. Um, and as a result, um, it was actually four major banks just started hoarding reserves and not providing liquidity to the, to the repo market and the repo market froze. And the Fed had to intervene by putting money into that market. As if a central bank started saying, we're not going to do that because we, are, we want markets to get used to scarce liquidity, we're going to have all manner of turbulence and difficulty in in markets, and that's potentially got contagion effects onto the real economy because that will raise borrowing costs 
in the real economy as well. Um, I was relieved to see that the central bank in the UK did provide liquidity to the long gilts market, but I was very concerned that it was going to withdraw it potentially prematurely. Now it did so to put pressure on its fiscal authority to row back on what was a very stupid um, budget. Um, and fortunately the fiscal authority did row back on that, but had it not done so, we were face potentially looking at a gilt market, um, a, a major gilt market collapse with contagion effects. And that really wasn't clever. I don't think central banks should be doing that kind of brinkmanship. But that said, it's, it was a very difficult situation for central bank because it, if it arguably, if it just stayed in the market and carried on providing liquidity, it was effectively financing its own government and um, and it was going to lose all credibility. So, you know, it's it this kind of balancing up really requires cooperation with the fiscal authority. And so we just avoid these kind of standoffs. So I have some better ideas. Get good information. I, I think more than ever before, central banks really need to be keeping a weather eye on what is going on around the world. It's really important, I think, that they don't just look at their own country. And I'm kind of looking at the Fed here, which does have a tendency to treat itself as purely the Amer America's central bank, and it only needs to be concerned about what's going on in the US, and doesn't pay a great deal of attention to what to the effects of its policies worldwide. It's been criticised publicly for this before um, and um, we're now seeing fed policy like raising interest rates quantitative tightening um, is going to push up the dollar and that's going to have quite bad effects on um, global trade global finance and on developing countries particularly and something like that. and i think this kind of thing does need to be rethought and and we we're seeing encouraging signs that central banks were beginning to cooperate to um, dampen the rise of the dollar you know they're moving towards a, a second plaza accord perhaps something like that um, and maybe we need more cooperation between central banks um, we also need more cooperation between central banks and fiscal authorities because as I pointed out if you've got um, a central bank and a fiscal authority both tightening at the same time you you kind of amplify the effects on the economy and you could easily easily push and, and push an economy into a, a very nasty crash. Um, and I don't think any of us want that. Um, we are all already looking at economies going into recession. Um, I'm not sure we want a depression as well. And, and it also raises the possibility that at some point central banks might have to do a big oops and do a, a hand, screeching handbrake turn and go back to doing loads of QE and dropping interest rates down. And I don't think we really want that either because that's really disruptive too. It would be better if we could manage a smooth landing. Um, and that brings me to another point here, which is um, one that I think doesn't get mentioned enough, and that is that inflation is not the only enemy. Um, I don't think it gets said enough. Runaway inflation is awful for everybody. And very high inflation isn't something you want to last for long. But sometimes the medicine can be worse than the disease. And there is a case for saying that central banks do need to consider um, accepting higher inflation for a while to give economies time to recover. Um, and thinking about who benefits, because you know, if you bring down inflation too quickly, too far, too quickly by means of quantitative tightening and fiscal consolidation, the people who are going to hurt are generally speaking the poor. And they're the very people that you were trying not to, trying who 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 are who you think are worst hurt by inflation. You know, unemployment is a terrible thing too. And if the price of bringing down inflation is that you end up with sky high unemployment, then who is benefiting really? Haven't the young suffered enough? And my final point here is if you do crash, for goodness sake, act quickly to soften the impact. And that brings me back to this screeching handbrake turn. I would rather that we didn't have a screeching handbrake turn. But if we have to have one, for goodness sake, do it. You know, it is not a shame on a central bank to say, oops, we've overdone it and act quickly to cut interest rates and restart QE if that is what the economic outlook is telling them. And there are already indicators that some central banks are over tightening. I had a few more final comments as well. Um, looking ahead, we need to 
think of a better way of doing monetary policy, one that doesn't widen inequality or give governments cover for foolish budget, budgetary decisions, whether that be on the profligate side or on the austere side. So one possibility, which got discussed a bit during the pandemic and is kind of on the back burner now, would be something like, CB, like a C, CBDCs, which would enable um, a central bank to reflate or deflate um, an economy directly by um, giving businesses and households money or removing it um, when economic um, conditions dictate, irrespective of whatever the fiscal authority is doing. The amount they could be put in could flex with inflation or with other indicators such as wage growth, GDP, unemployment. The obvious problem here is that is democratic accountability. Should a central bank really be that able to act on its own? Or should we really be still be saying it's up to the fiscal authorities to fly the helicopters and the central bank simply to provide the money to 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 provide the, the money? Um, there's an obvious problem with this flex CBC, CBDC like that, effectively universal basic income, which is that when you remove it, you're effectively taxing people. And in most countries, taxation is the province of the fiscal authority because it's something that people need to give their approval to. They need to vote on it. And I think we need to think very carefully about removing from people the right to vote on whether to be taxed. And that also touches on the question of um, remuner remunerating reserves as well, because taxing banks um, by dropping reserve remuneration down to zero would also tax savers. And again, they're not exactly getting any say in this. So we need to think about the de democratic accountability of an effective central bank um, that is actually able to act on its own um, initiative much more to reflate and deflate economies at need. Um, I've mentioned already that CBC, CB's central banks can control the yields on government bonds. That I've seen people saying that they should do this at all times, at all times, commit to keeping government bonds low so that governments can always um, afford, borrow whatever they need to to finance whatever they want to do. The problem I have with that is that it tends, is it ignores the effect on the currency. That if um, if the perception in the markets is that the central bank is helping the government do, do something really stupid, the currency will take the hit. Um, we've seen that recently. Um, and a, 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 um, a, a currency that is being attacked because the central bank is being perceived to support its government doing something stupid. Um, we've seen this in, it, we, normally this is thought of as monetizing deficits, but actually yield curve control could be equally seen as doing something stupid. Um, supporting something stupid. So we need to be very careful about assuming that central banks can always do things like um, supporting um, yields without there being consequences elsewhere, um, such as in investment flight, and as I said, in potentially a run on the currency. So we need to, to consider all, all the moving parts here. And sometimes I think a, a central bank actually saying, no, I'm not gonna support, no, I'm not gonna control your yields. It might be the lesser of two evils. Um, this one has been has been doing around rounds before. Um, central banks could adopt NGDP targets rather than targeting inflation. One of the criticisms that gets made of an inflation target is it doesn't really allow room for economies to grow. Um, so you're constantly trying to get inflation down to two percent or up to two percent, which is actually what central banks have been doing for a lot of the lot, ever since the financial crisis until the last really until this year. Um, and in Japan for much longer, are not paying a great deal of attention to the actual output side of the economy. Um, so some people argue that adopting an NGDP target, which is real GDP plus inflation, actually allows central banks to, in effect, flex their inflation target more to allow room for growth. Uh, jury's out on that one. I am, I'm fairly neutral on so I'd appreciate comments. Um, related to that, I've also seen suggestions that central banks should inflation, increase, the, increase the inflation target. Um, I personally would prefer to see them just um, treat a treat the inflation target as symmetrical, um, so a long period below the target, arguably should be balanced by quite a long period above it, 
which amounts to temporarily raising your inflation target. But again, this is something we can discuss. And um, another one that does surround from time to time, see central banks could res raise reserve requirements for banks to 100% and target the money supply directly. It's a sovereign money proposal, so they have a long and distinguished pedigree. Um, likely casualty would be lending to the real economy and with consequent implications, both for economic growth and also for inequality, because interest rates would be structurally higher in such a paradigm, I think, and that would mean marginal borrowers such as small businesses and young households would find it very difficult to borrow um, to smooth out consumption over their lifetimes. And that, that is, is actually quite regressive, I think. If the lend also, if the lending chill was severe, there would be considerable incentive for non-banks, possibly offshore ones, to create alternative monies. They do that. They do that even when we don't have 100% reserve requirements. So for heaven's sake, they would do that if we did. Um, and my final parting shot really is about governments that actually, you know, the elephant in this particular room in this discourse about all the things that central banks could do is governments. Um, and the dead hand of governments on everything. There are governments that, that, that you know, arguably spend too much, are carelessly spending, but actually the disease we've had in the last decade or more has been governments actually not spending enough, um, with the exception of the brief exception of the pandemic period, um, and shooting at moving targets such as debt, deficits and growth without considering the outcomes that they actually want. Um, I would prefer to see governments and central banks cooperating to agree what outcomes a democratic, a democratic ele elected government wants and how and construct the policies and work out how they're going to achieve them rather than setting these kind of moving targets and then desperately shooting at them without ever really considering whether this is um the best for the economy and for the population so i think i'm just about out of time it's been an absolute pleasure to give this uh talk i've covered a lot of ground and i'm sure you've all got lots of questions so i'll shut up now and let um pe let people throw questions at me um actually there are uh, several questions uh uh, asked uh, through the chat uh, during your uh, presentation. Um, maybe we should uh, start with those. Uh, if you like, you can look at the chat yourself and uh, see those questions and uh, answer them. Uh, they are from Alev Yildirim. Yes, I've just seen it. Okay, so the question, can you all see the chat, everybody? Um, yes, I think everybody should be able to see it. Yeah. Um, this is particularly in relation to the chart, uh, you see chart, I, that one, I, on CPI with food and energy prices. Um, do I believe the US is affected as much of the rest as the rest of the world, and particularly the EU, from the conflict in Ukraine, or do I think it's rather a consequence of the pandemic stimulus? Um, this is one of those areas where um, kind of proximity to the conflict tends to increase the impact and also the fact that certainly the kind of the further east you go in Europe, the more dependent um, they are and the closer the links to Russia. Um, and also the EU, EU countries generally are quite dependent on Russia for energy supplies. So I do think that the EU generally or European countries are worse affected by the war than the US is the US does have a, it's further away, and it's not as depend. It's more self-sufficient in energy. It's more self-sufficient in food. It's not so so um, tied to Russia. In fact, it's actually been quite antagonistic to Russia, really. So, in a way, it's relatively protected, relatively buffered from the conflict. And I think that actually sometimes informs the discourse so when you hear americans talking they will talk as if this is all about the fed the stimmy checks the pandemic supply chains and ukraine war is something that's happening over there and doesn't really affect them much it, it does affect them a bit but 
and and smirch. And then they tend to tend to talk as if that's the same for everybody. And it emphatically isn't. So it's I think it's very much depends where you are in the world and how bad and, and what your relationship with Russia is like, what your relationship with Ukraine is like and what your relationship with countries affected is. Um, so how do I assess the in, in, in fact the Inflation Reduction Act? Um, I must confess I haven't looked at this closely. Um, inflation in the US um, arguably needs concerted action not only by the central bank but also by the fiscal authority because it is um, fiscal stimulus that in part generated this inflation and it's not only and the EU, US government does need to withdraw it and that implies higher taxes one way or another. Um, I haven't looked to see how um, effective the Inflation Reduction Act is. Yes, I think we have also, I mean, you have to give these things time to have their effect. That said, some of the forecasts I've seen suggest that inflation in the US is going to come down, is, is going to come down next year. So which suggests that something at any rate is working. Does that answer your question? Uh, somebody's got yes, a... thank you very much. Thank you. Um, um, Alev has another question also. Uh, if you just scroll down, you'll see it. Um, the second one. Yes. Um, there, uh, somebody's, uh, there's somebody with their hand up. Uh, Özgür, I guess. Uh, maybe we should, uh, Özgür should start to uh, ask the question first and then we can continue with Alev. Okay. Sure, sure. Uh, thank you very much, Francis. Uh, I have, uh, I've got about like 25 questions. Uh, <laughs> you have to email them to me, so I'll not send you a written answer. Uh, but I've got a bunch of questions kind of like tied together, uh, trying to like sort of uh, make sense of all this uh, story. So the first one is your uh, emphasis on that. Uh, we can't go back to the pre-2008 monetary system which kind of like uh, gives me the impression that the Fed or in general, the world is caught between a rock and a hard place, so to speak, right? You know, if you keep doing the quietening, qu uh, the quantitative tightening, you know, the helicopter is likely to crash, but you can't continue the QE as is right now. And what is your sort of like, impression uh, in the sense that uh, tying this with the 2019 repo freeze, because mm. if the pandemic didn't start in 2020, right, it seemed like the Fed would have to restart some sort of QE again, in yeah. some markets at least, right? So it kind of like looked like uh, there was no way out of uh, this anyway. Uh, but then there wasn't any problems with inflation and whatever. So yeah. nobody seemed to care much about that. So that's sort of like uh, my first question in the sense that are we just kind of like stuck in two bad outcomes in a way, mm. uh, given the institutional framework, given the political you know framework and all that kind of stuff. The second part of the question related with this is... Uh, what is your impression in terms of uh, finance in general? And when I say finance, I'm talking about large banks, investment funds, pension funds. Uh, they, they seem to be losing a lot with this QT as well, right? And, and a lot of them seem to me at least eager to see a, you know, the Fed pivoting at some point, and some are betting on that and those kind of things. Uh, so, Given the relationship with uh, between the Fed and finance in general, uh, how likely do you see that the Fed is going to actually give up at some point to the demands of finance in general and pivot? Maybe. Uh, I don't want to make it more complicated, but uh, if you want, uh, would you also comment on Yellen's latest sort of approach in terms of... Uh, the treasury sort of like, uh, I'm not sure what she was uh, meaning actually, I haven't quite, but uh, the way I understood was she was talking about like switching short-term bonds with long-term bonds in the market and treasury getting involved with this QT as well. Uh, so 
if you have any any impressions on that okay. i'll save the other 22 questions <laughs> there's lots in there's lots to unpack in that i think that the general thrust actually of all of your comments and what underlies it is a little bit of a confusion that i think has developed but about the purpose of qe um or perhaps more accurately of large-scale asset purchases i'm using that term because qe is a macroeconomic tool its purpose is to depress interest rates along the curve to in, with, with the intention of encouraging corporate borrowing and you know just generally easing monetary conditions whereas we uh, central banks also now use large scale asset purchases to provide liquidity to markets and act as dealer of last resort in the markets which is an essential function but they haven't their kind of communication function has not clearly separated those two. And so whenever a central bank does something like intervening in a, in a market as dealer of last resort to buy, um, well, as the Fed did with, with, with repo to inject to inject it to provide liquidity, liquidity to the repo market, or the Bank of England did with long gilts to um to prop up the guilt guilt prices so pension funds could actually get some cash you know this sort of thing and um, people are saying oh they're going to restart qe no it's a specific market intervention um desire to make to can make sure that markets continue to operate properly and it really addressed and it really is this question of central banks have become responsible for ensuring smooth market operation and that means ensuring that there is always a good supply of liquidity to markets, because when markets don't have liquidity, they, things go badly wrong. And we now have relied upon, come to rely on central banks to, to provide liquidity to be liquidity providers to markets, to be market makers in some respect, and certainly to act as dealers of last resort in distressed markets. Um, I, for one, wouldn't want to see central banks stopping doing that. I think it's a vital function, but it would help if they separated that out from QE as its macro, as a macroeconomic tool. Really, as a dealer of last resort, a central bank should be able to intervene at any point in the curve. It doesn't matter, you know, wherever the distress, wherever the pinch point is and whatever the asset class is, it should be able to intervene to provide support to that particular market to stop it freezing. So the Central Bank of, of the UK was buying 30 year gilts. Um, yes, there will have been a monetary poly, policy effect of that. Now, one thing that central banks can do to deal with that is if they're doing a specific intervention like that, they can sterilize it. So in the case of the, of the, um, of the Bank of England, buying 30 year gilts, it could have sterilized that by selling some of its T-bills um, to keep the monetary, um, to keep it's good to keep the, the uh, monetary framework uh, uh, paradigm the same. It didn't do so because it was expecting to embark on QT. So it was going to sell them anyway. So it didn't bother. Um, and that so con quant quantitative tightening complicates this because your central bank is selling um, most probably mostly short dated um stock so if it's got to intervene in the market and suddenly starts to have to buy particular ones then it, in a way it's interfering with with its monetary policy and they need to sort that out in their communication function i think um they are going to get a lot of lobbying from banks who that are have got used to um making easy money by um dumping uh, <laughs> deposits at the central bank and hoovering up some pennies um, and perhaps more importantly um, markets have got used to cheap liquidity liquidity may remain copious but it's not going to remain cheap and I think that markets have got to adapt to paying more for liquidity and that is going to be quite painful I think um, and, and there'll be some heavy lobbying and central banks will be under pressure to back off, to lower interest rates again, to slow down quantitative tightening, to think about the tenor, about which, which bonds they're selling and when, and, and, and also interacting with their fiscal authorities. And I think this is probably where Janet Yellen was coming from. Um, so that, um, because if the central bank is selling bonds, 
and the fiscal authorities issuing bonds at the same time, then they have to think about the effect on the whole curve. And that will affect both the decision the central bank makes about which bonds it sells, and also the decision of the fiscal authority about what tenor of bonds it issues. Um, and so it will be quite a complex um, balancing act to try and do quantitative tightening and still issue new debt, which governments will have to continue to do because they've got massive deficits, which aren't, and aren't going to go away anytime soon, um, without met, um, ending up with bizarrely distorted yield curves. Um, it'll be interesting to see how they do that. I think Osgur uh, uh, also asked the question about the uh, what I would call the operation twist, uh, the uh, yeah. Yellen yeah. Treasury yeah, is planning to do. Maybe you want to answer that or say a few things about it also as well. Yeah, well, I mean, it kind of touches on that really. Mm -hmm. That that um, she what I mean, I I, I confess, Sabri, I haven't seen her remarks, so I, I'm a little bit in the dark here. Um, uh, Essentially, uh, my understanding was that uh, they uh, plan to um, shorten the uh, average uh, maturity of the uh, U.S. Treasuries and outstanding U.S. Treasuries by uh, repurchasing the long-term bonds and issuing short-term bonds, oh, yeah. uh, essentially over one to three months uh, yeah. uh, issuance and buying back uh, longer-term Treasuries probably from 7 to 30 or something like that. Okay. Yeah, no, I understand now. I understand now. And I and I, I mean, I could hazard a few guesses as to what her thinking is as Treasury Secretary. And it's about this relationship between between the Fed and the Treasury when it comes to debt management and the mm -hmm. the the, uh, the role of government debt in monetary policy and in market liquidity. So yeah. the Fed's going to be if the Fed's going to be doing QT, um, then potentially the Fed is is um um what the Fed is doing is withdrawing liquidity from the market. I would imagine that Yellen's thinking is about most liquidity in the market is using short term. So collateral, for example, is using shorter term um, bonds. So she's probably concerned that she that the supply of short term bonds yeah. might get a bit low. So the okay. Treasury will need to change its issuance towards the short end to try and maintain the, the stock of collateral. Yeah, um, one way that I see it is uh, related with this RRP, reverse repurchase uh, yeah. account at the Fed. There are about 2.5 or so trillion dollars there. And if they become yeah. reserves, uh, then it will uh, turn into lots of liquidity in the market without, yeah. even though, uh, Fed uh, continues doing this quantitative tightening, the RRP becoming reserves would uh, probably compensate uh, for that. And since money market mutual funds are those uh, who are uh, doing those uh, RRPs with the Fed and they need short-term uh, bonds uh, to uh, invest in, uh, increasing the uh, amount of short-term bonds may help uh, Fed to release some of those RRPs and turn them into uh, uh, reserves so that the uh, re liquidity needs of the market uh, would uh, be uh, compensated. Uh, I don't know. That might yeah. be one that, of that the reasons sounds, I think. That sounds entirely plausible, Sabri. I, I would have thought it was to do with market liquidity because, uh, yeah. I mean, of course, she was previously the um, central bank governor so she understand she would understand that the um the pressures that the fed is under and the difficulty of balancing um what the quantitative tightening program with maintaining market liquidity um while also fighting inflation so i would imagine this is all part of the um the treasury needs to help in a way the treasury yeah. needs to help the central bank um yeah you know, we used to think of central banks of, as help as supporting their governments, but this is an occasion where the Treasury Action needs to support its central bank. Um, so which is back to this whole kind of cooperation between central bank and treasury, which I think is going to be vital 
um, if they're going to um, avoid crashing the economy. And the last thing we need is to have fiscal and, and um, central bank um, either cancelling each other's activities or, or, or amplifying them in, an, in a very unhelpful way for the economy. That might be the only good thing on this on this thing, I guess, like that you have someone, some ex-Fed chair uh, heading the treasury, I guess, who understands these operations, right? So uh, so she's doing some central banking at the treasury as well, you know? Yeah, I, th I think she is, isn't she? But then maybe we have to recognize, I mean, you know, you know do we, we have this idea that central banking is somehow completely separate from 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 the the fiscal authority and in a money in a in a in a monetary sense it is it is but when you're do when you're dealing with the unwinding of a very large QE program where the um central bank holds a lot of the government's debt and is trying potentially trying to release that onto the market and that the government is also issuing debt then it they're not independent of each other at all they're both they're both playing in the same market and they've got to coordinate their attacks as it were you know right. otherwise we could end up with a disaster thank you there are uh, two other questions if you look at the chats one was uh yeah. Alev's, the second question and uh yeah. Who else was the uh and yeah, uh, Tom, um, Tom also asked the question? I see. Yes, I it's it, there's a question. The, the last question is is about whether asset purchasing programs will be the permanent policy tool of central banking. Yeah, I'm afraid they are now well established in, in the toolkit. And I don't think it is just heterodox economists that are saying that. I think it's central banks themselves. I've even heard them called conventional policy. I, I think back to 2008 and go, conventional? Where did that come from? Because they, they, all the soul searching everybody went through at the time about, oh my goodness, this is going to, we're going to have runaway inflation, this is terrible. And, and the Fed desperate trying to keep the programmes short and defined. The first two rounds of Fed QE were limited precisely because it wanted them to be one-offs. Um, but now it seems to be an accepted that QE is the go-to tool for um, you know, a shortfall in demand or, and also large-scale asset purchases to intervene in markets that have uh, intervened in, market, in distressed markets too. So the policy communication there is quite difficult. So yes, I would say that asset purchase, asset purchases are going forward is going to be remain a key part of central bank toolkits i think we could do them better i think we are still working out um how they can be used more effectively but i don't think they're going to go away yeah i agree with that they're going to continue using it uh alev had a second question if you recall yes, uh, that we postponed let me just have a look if we're talking about a reserve money should a central bank only focus on employment i think i touched on this didn't i i think i said that i thought that central banks and particularly the big central banks like you know the reserve currency issuers um you know the us the ecb bank of japan and um, bank of england you know the the major reserve currency issue issuers should not be only looking at their own backyard because their their policies have spillover effects to other countries, either through effects on countries that are actually using their currency. There are a few of those, um, and but more um, through the effects on global trade and global saving behavior, and the, the effects on the currencies. So, for example, Fed policies raising the dollar's exchange rate. Um, has bad effects on the rest of the world. It amplifies, it, it, it effectively tightens monetary policy for every other country in the world on top of what they are already doing themselves. And in some countries, that's actually, and for some countries, that's really not helpful to them. Um, so I think that the reserve currency issuers do have a responsibility to take into account the effect of their the spillover effect of their policies to other parts of the world. I'm aware that this is a controversial view, but I actually believe this quite strongly. Uh, any other questions? So actually, 
it's 9 20 now our time 8 20 hours uh, i believe it's very late for you oh, so, so sorry uh, 6 20 i think for you uh, anyway um if uh, there is no other question uh i think uh this is the end uh, of the webinar we thank uh francis for uh, this nice presentation and, and coming here and uh, talking to us and